so it it doesn't have to look hey like guys thanks for official. joining uh, this is john jay uh, may may 30th and uh i just want to start the conversation today uh well i want to mention the websites and all that jazz but i just want to talk about property rights as i always do but i, I thought it was just so interesting to just give you an understanding or an analysis of what's happening in family court. This is happening all around you. And hopefully you're not in that situation in, in a family court situation, but look, this is happening to your neighbor. You guys should be alarmed. Uh, and I think you will be once I go through some of these uh, and, and talk about it and Ray and, and Mocha, you can keep me on track. Cause I know I, I get out there sometimes, but um, a, a lot of this, I just added some more material to uh, divorce in the state. Ray, go ahead and unmute if you wanted to. I added some more material today, and so I'm gonna just kind of—I'm not going to talk about it so much today, but I just wanted to get into the overview of it. Uh, so check out aceofcoins.club. All right, there's a lot of content information there. If you haven't been on privacyfight.io, okay, we're, we've migrated everything over, and I'm adding more content to these subscriptions. So there's LLC strategies, divorce in the state, the biometric lien, all these things. Okay, the easements and all that. All right, so. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to do was start off by uh, talking about this situation where you have family court. And, and so I, I have to use the stereotypical example, okay? I'm not trying to disparage anybody, but let's just use the stereotypical or statistical example where most wives file for divorce if there's going to be a divorce in the court, 80% of them. That's just a number. So I'm just going to go on that. So the wife goes to the court to, to get a divorce petition. Okay, fine. And that's what the court is for, okay? The court is has certain types of jurisdiction the court can award money judgments right the court can also order things to happen or order order a um someone to be enjoined from doing something okay it's called uh equitable relief injunction right injunctive relief so injunctive relief includes declaratory judgment like the the court can declare the existence existence of something the court can declare rights of a party okay you can petition the court for declaratory relief uh, to declare the rights of something or liabilities or whatever. So if you petition for divorce, what you're doing is asking the court to exercise its authority to grant declaratory relief. Why would I do that? Well, because husband and wife, for example, have intertwined all kinds of property ownership, right? And obligations into society. And so the date of the dissolution of that marital relationship is important and it should be a matter of public record. And so the court serves a very important function to declare that that day, because that may have something to do with the uh, mortgage, you know, the payment on that uh, and, and so forth, all kinds of other things. It may have something to do with pension funds and things like that. These are within the purview of the family, not the court, the property rights of the family. Now, throughout the time, let's say the, the family has children, let's say they're minors and some of them are not right. Just as a wide variety. Okay. So, Obviously, the children are still alive and there's no allegations of abuse or neglect. And why do, I, why do I say the children are still alive? Well, we assume that in a divorce proceeding where there's minor children, they're still alive. Well, why is that important? Well, didn't someone have to pay for that? Someone's paying for that, right? The court likes to call that alimony. <laughs> you've been paying it. <laughs> Child support, you've been paying it. All right, child custody, child care, you've been taking care of that and you have the liability for that and nobody else on the planet does. So liability creates authority. Without the liability, you shut up. If you don't have the liability, you don't have the authority. So what's the state doing getting involved in your divorce beyond the declaration of its dissolution? They lost their way. How do you have, or for example, so the wife, the wife files a petition, right? So let's say she leaves the family. She leaves the household. Maybe she doesn't like the guy anymore, right? Leaves the household for some reason, who cares? And goes to get another place. Well, she did that. She's outside the household. If I'm the husband, I'm thinking she's still the beneficiary of our arrangement. And okay, she doesn't want to be with me anymore. Okay, fine. There'll be a date in the future where maybe the benefits will change. But for right now, I don't mind supporting her. I, I loved her and all this stuff, but she wants to go on her own way. Okay, fine. That's a private matter, okay? But she's still the beneficiary. Well, she left without terms. She left without coordinating the terms with me. Thank you very much. Right, it's like using the court to create the terms. Yeah, okay, so she left without terms. My point is, now she goes, circles back around and goes to the court to prevail upon 
an association of professionals, lawyers, to gain access to the police power to get different terms than she already had, to get different benefits than she was already receiving. So let me give an analogy. Let's say I'm in a business contract and it's a three-way split, right? We split the net, it goes three ways. And then one day I say, I quit and I walk away. Then three months later, I sue the partnership for something. I just make, I want something, I don't know. And the partners say, well, you voluntarily left and it was under the provisions of our contract. We don't have a problem with you leaving, but you left under terms that were already established. You can't go back to the court now and change the terms. And that's what I'd be trying to do, right? Well, that's what the wife is doing in this case. Now, sometimes the, the husband does that, but I'm just saying stereotypical example, the wife goes to change the terms after she already abandoned the marriage the marital estate, the marital property, the marital home, she abandoned that, abandoned her role because, you know, if you're living in a different place, it becomes more difficult to sit, fulfill that same role, whatever. So this is what's going on. And the court says, okay, we'll help you there. <clears throat> so the court says, let's discover assets, meaning let's find out what property you have. Let's find out what money everybody has, the husband, the wife. And then the court is going to decide how that's going to be allocated going forward. What? The court wasn't involved in, in the intellectual understanding that both parents and husband and wife had, where they decided how to use the money the most effective way. Most parents do, most husband and wife, they figure out how to pay the bills most effectively. They're pretty good at that. And so what is a corporation going to do now? What authority does a corporation have to come in there and start deciding how the money is going to be spent afterwards? And we're going to call that alimony and child support and, and child custody. Where's the underlying obligation that permits the court to do it, first of all? So let's go back to the example of a debt collection. Let's say I really had a contract with a bank that I borrowed money from and I didn't pay. And there's a default and the bank sued and, and then got a judgment, right? and rightly so, right? And now what? So the, the judge can liquidate me? Am I, am I uh, subject to being imprisoned for not paying? I already lost the case. There's a judgment against me. The judgment acts as a lien on my property or interest in property. The judgment can be used to levy against property I have. There's a remedy. But in our modern society, we don't have debtor's prisons. I'm not saying the defense is there are no debtor's prisons. It's more complicated than that because you're looking at a receivership. All right. I said it. That's the receivership that's happening in family court. So there's no underlying debt. So you cannot have a receivership without an underlying debt, but the judge is sitting in receivership. In order to have a receivership, mm -hmm. you have to have a debtor or debtor in possession. You have to have creditors that have filed a proof of claim. Someone has to make a written claim. Someone has to have a perfected security interest. What does that look like? What is a perfected security interest, Ray? It's a perfected contract with a, it's encumberment. Yeah, like what example would that be? Well, a mortgage. Exactly. A mortgage is a perfected security interest, and it gives the bank, the lender, the right to take your stuff because it's collateral, right? A perfected <laughs> security interest in collateral. Perfect. I hate them, but they do it. Okay, fine. I agree to it. It's a statute staple. It's the law. What perfected security interest is there for a judge to liquidate you because the other spouse asked for declaratory relief? There isn't any. Is there, there isn't one, but does that is that how they're using stipulations? Is that what they're trying this to? This is what they do. Mm -hmm. they, right, they oh, and perfected just means it's been filed. It's an official document. Well, there's a something. There's a security agreement. There's a, a recorded lien instrument of some kind. There's a debt obligation of some kind. But think about this. The, it's the marital community that's involved here, but it's never identified as the debtor, which is really what should be happening. But the court doesn't have jurisdiction in the first place. I'm just, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the marital community or the marital estate would be the debtor or debtor in possession. Now, here's the interesting thing. People think, well, John, there is a debt. Th there was a mortgage. Ah, but think about this. The, the mortgage was to the individual husband and or wife. That is not what's being liquidated here. What's being liquidated is the marital estate without naming the marital estate as the debtor in possession and Banks don't lend to marital estates. So the marital estate is not a debtor to anybody. It's an innocent party. has It's debt-free. Think about it, guys. Mm. Your marital estate is debt-free. I bet you never realized that.
you might have debts. You and your spouse may have debts and your spouse may have debts. Your marital estate is debt free. Why? Because there's no perfected security interest against your marital estate. There might be one against you and your other property rights. Okay. Why do we, why do we know this? Let's say I'm cuckoo. I probably am, but let's say I don't know what I'm talking about. Go ask a banker what the underwriting rules are for lending money to a marital estate and you'll get a blank stare. There is no such thing. Ask them what the underwriting rules are for lending money to your dog. Right? None. So how can there be a debtor in possession of the thing that they're liquidating, which is your marital estate? They never say it is. There's no perfected security interest. There's no debt instruments. There's no receivables. There's no rents. There's no you know, factoring. There's nothing going on there where there's a collateral identified in the marital state. There's no collateral. There's no anything. No one's filed a proof of claim. So, so how do you then, how does the statute, this is what they're doing. They're, they're acting upon a statute. The statute says you have to divide the property in this way. Okay. So the statute says that, but the statute itself does not create an underlying debt. See, it's just like the, I'll go back to the 1905 case where, where we're talking about the fake pandemic, right? Where they were saying, well, you have to get vaccinated. Okay, fine. But that act is subject to judicial review. It requires evidence before you're actually required to do it. The statute might say, but it doesn't create a duty to do anything. So the statutes in family court and divorce court, the subject, the statutes um, are administrative. And they do not create a debt obligation. So what happens, like, it's like Mocha saying, uh, the, the court just gets you to play along and sign stipulations about how you're going to spend your money. Yeah, I'll agree to pay alimony. Yeah, I'll agree to pay child support. Why do I think I have to do that? Oh, because I watched TV for the last 30 years. I've been programmed. They had to agree. Yeah. You know, well, so it's not the, it's not the uh, husband and spouse, the relationship between husband and spouse is what makes me think of immediately. It's a contract. And, you know, and then it's even listed in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10. So no state shall impair the obligation to contract. That's what they're doing. They're, that's they're, what they're doing. They're, they're actually interfering with a property right. That's why I like to look at it. You have a private intangible property right to decide what to do with your money. And unless there's evidence and allegations of, and allegations of, has to start with allegations, has to be an evidentiary hearing of abuse or neglect, the state has no duty to act. So the court is without jurisdiction to talk about what to do with your property, to cure the abuse or neglect. There can be neglect in the form of financial neglect. That's a rare one, but a lot of times it's 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 abuse, like that you get a, the, the husband gets accused of raising his voice too much, you know, or or something. But there are cases where he is abusive, so I can't talk about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a case where there is no abuse or no allegations of it. So if the court is acting in receivership, it can do that. It cannot do that, though, under a petition for dissolution of marriage or separation or child custody. You you can't, like if someone sued for um, a debt and the court can't then get into some other matter, the court can only talk about the debt. If someone sues for dissolution of marriage, the court can't conduct involuntary receivership. The pleadings have to be amended. The pleading is the complaint that was original that, that got the case number when you filed the case. That's your pleading, okay? You're asking the court for something. Remember, the court is ecclesiastical, so they call it pleading, all right? You're pleading, you're praying. <laughs> right. Really, I mean, you got to think about this stuff. So yeah, yeah, it's true. We though. do this to ourselves, and it's okay. It's it's how people, modern people, avoid having uh, duels in the street at noon. Okay. Fortunately, we resolve things. Hopefully, we can do it on paperwork without fighting in the streets. So I'm okay with that. It's kind of arcane, but okay. Except so, we've given up our authority to it. It's really shifted. We, yeah, we kind of forgot. So our parents let it go because, you know, maybe the divorce rate wasn't high enough. I mean, now it's 50%. Uh, and they weren't paying attention. And why, why wouldn't the bankers use it? I mean, think about it. If your mortgage, if you work really hard to get 5%, and I may be getting off subject here, but let's say you work really hard to get 5% mortgage. You think that's cool. And on the face of your mortgage, it's 5%. If you refinance under four to six years or so, or 10 years, whatever, when you refinance because you think you get a better rate, what happens to the internal rate of return for the bank? 
forget the face value of your note. What what's the bank getting out of it? Do you think it's still getting the five percent? It's probably getting the five percent plus the new refinance is two separate it's, instruments. Oh man, you guys are gonna get pissed off. You should be angry. If you're refinancing your mortgage and you think you had a 5% rate, yeah, the rate's right. You get it, you refinance it and you get a 4.5% rate. Here's what the bank's getting when you refinance the older paper. I'm just going to make up a number that's probably close to what you're, the bank's actually getting. An internal rate of return of about 67%. Probably more. It's probably over 100%. It's called an internal rate of return or on the net present value of the cash flow, the note. Check it out. So do you think there's some bank interest behind the divorce rate we have? It's bigger than what you think. It's bigger than just family court. It's systemic. So and you think of no all the people involved. involved. There's guardian ad litem. There's the attorneys. Yeah, so like they bring in all their buddies, right? They right. use the guardian ad litem in many cases just to... Um, just to uh, coerce or penalize or retaliate against, uh, let's say, the husband who's saying, wait a minute, you can't tell me what to do with my property. I have all the liability. You mm -hmm. can't just walk in here and tell me what to do with my property and walk out of here and I'm still liable for taking care of everybody. I've already decided how to do it. It's none of your business. Right. And stripping away the money that you need to do the taking care of. <laughs> yeah. And many, and that, that's not, it's, it's about liquidating you. They want you to go into bankruptcy. The, the judge is acting in receivership, okay, where the pleadings have not been amended to petition the court for involuntary receivership. Right. Why? Because you couldn't meet the pleading requirements. Right. What are they? Well, there has to be enough creditors. There has to be enough debt. There has to be debt. There ha you have to identify the debtor in possession of the property mm -hmm. that has to be liquidated. That's mm -hmm. never done. So the judge acts in, uh, in, in receivership Right. Not telling anybody. Not right. all, he's not insured for this. Right. He's he's right. so the judge normally appoints the receiver, but the judge is acting as the exactly. receiver. Exactly, receiver. You come in asking for a dissolution of marriage, but he turns it into an involuntary the receivership. receivership. It's like that's, as soon as they start with discovery, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. When they discover your assets, your property, that's what the judge is doing. It's receivership, mm -hmm. and so you say, "Whoa, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, judge! This is only a petition for the dissolution. Where I'm not." There's no, there's no application here to appoint a, a receiver and you can't act a as a receiver either. And where's the underlying debt? So what's alimony right. based on? What underlying debt is alimony based on? There isn't any. Some Someone's fantasy. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay X thing, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you were already paying money. You were paying money to your wife, let's say, and she left. Okay, well, she abandoned the money, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was the benefit. She abandoned it. Well, you're a nice guy, so you're going to try to work it out with her. But when she goes to get a gang of people so she can access the police and use them against you to get right. something from you that you don't want to give or that wouldn't suit the situation. Right. So what people need to do is maybe turn more towards like an arbitration agreement or coming up with their own understanding so that they leave the marriage with terms already defined, not going to a court. Oh, sure. You want yeah. to avoid you don't want to give the court the, the, the idea that it can tell you what to do with your money and, and, or, or you don't participate in that. Mm -hmm. I've got one right now where the, 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 the mother wants to um, change the custody and they couldn't reach an agreement. Right. So she goes to the court to try to force the guy into changing the, the custody. And that's what's going on. So we just filed a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Just because the parents have a disagreement as to how to care for the child doesn't involve the court. It doesn't involve the police power no, no more than you could call the police to have the, uh, an officer come and cut your grass on Saturday. Right. You can't use public funds for that. Right. So that's that was actually the argument I made in the motion, you know. And and so I hope it makes the point. We'll see. But yeah, it's a property right. So child custody is a property right, and the right comes from the liability. The right is the authority. If you have the liability to care for your children and your wife and former wife, and then she wants to leave, okay, you still, I think you still have some sort, sort of accountability to take care of her until she moves on with her life. I mean, really, just out of respect for a human being, right? But when the court comes in there, that's just like, you know, using the military to kill a, a mosquito. Come on, guys. We can't be doing that.
But anyways, it happens. And yeah, you can head it off with an arbitration agreement. You can get out of the court. But, you know, most of the time we're not doing stuff like that because so many people are afraid to bring this up with their spouse. The way I like to phrase it is like, if you look at my video series, Divorce in the State, you're going to see what I'm talking about is I'm literally divorcing the state. Wow. I'm not trying to break up your marriage. I'm just showing you. You guys want to remove the state because right now, whether or not you have a marriage license or you live together or whatever you call your relationship, it doesn't matter. It could be deemed a marriage if someone goes to when one of you goes to the court and petitions for something relating to that based on your residency. That's where the court is acting on. The court thinks it has jurisdiction over everything because it does have jurisdiction over residence, but it doesn't have jurisdiction over everything. Just because you're a resident doesn't mean the court owns you. The court has very limited jurisdiction. So anyways, I just want to share that. Um, and, and I guess, you know, there are remedies. And, and I talk about that in my, in my video series. It gets kind of ugly, but people should just, I want you guys to realize that there's a lot of uh, ugliness going on here and you're getting liquidated, okay? Your neighbor's getting liquidated in family court. It needs to stop. And uh, we, we're creating a, an association. It's called Fathers and Husbands Association. Uh, and I, I don't know if we have a URL for that set up yet. Um, and if, if not, it's my fault because it's so busy with other stuff. But I want to create a, a, a forum where men, and I'm focused on men, have a resource so they can collaborate and work together. I mean, really, we want to take care of our wives and ex-wives, and uh, most of us, okay? And so many times when I get calls for, with people, I say, here's the first thing you need to do is try to, usually it's men, you, uh, try to work out a, a list of stipulations with your wife that she wants to leave or whatever. You've already done that your whole life, your whole relationship. You've already made agreements of all kinds and you just haven't put them in writing. But for, for going forward, why don't you put them in writing just so everyone can be on the same page here? It's an important relationship. So reach stipulations first. You know, even if you're arguing with each other, there are some things you can't agree on, especially if you have children and you're going to be mature adults, you know, and, and realize, mm -hmm. okay, we got to put aside our argument here. So Always try to get at stipulations first. Now, ironically, I tell the husband, the soon-to-be ex-husband, don't fight your own money. Guys, this is so important. If your wife takes your money to hire an attorney to break apart your marriage, she's taken marital property to break apart the marriage and destroy her benefits and interfere with your fiduciary obligations as trustee, because that's really what you are as the husband and the father. You're a trustee. So... Don't fight your own money. Don't let her use that money. Cut her off. And I know that sounds cruel, but you're not trying to you're not trying to defeat her in some way or destroy her. What you want to do is be the moral, responsible person and do the right thing and make your own decision. Make it to where you are going to be responsible, like you have been, and keep the court out of it. If she goes to you know bring in a lawyer or something, you got a big problem. Now you're fighting your own money because as soon as it gets into court. The first thing that's going to happen is the judge is going to order the discovery, discovery of your property. And he'll, he'll levy your wages right away and he'll pay the opposing party's attorney, which, by the way, there is no opposing party in a marriage. The attorneys make this stuff up. You can't have a husband and wife that are plaintiff and defendant. There's no such thing. It doesn't even make any sense. Now, if there is such a thing like petition for dissolution, the caption would read in the matter of the marriage of blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, Jim and Jill Smith, right? That's how it should read. But instead, what they've been doing lately is they just name the petitioner versus the respondent, husband and wife. They're not adversaries. Mm -hmm. So courts only have jurisdiction over adversarial situations. How how are their adversaries with husband and wife all of a sudden? If they're viewed in law as a single person, now all of a sudden they're adversaries? Nope. But the court does it because why? Liquidation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Right. And um, when you say adversaries, you're not talking about the fact that, yes, people, it, when they decide to break up their marriage, are very angry at each other and they're fighting. It's not that. That's not the way you're using the word adversary. You mean literally, like legally, you can't be adversaries they're, because they're not adversaries. A marriage is the definition of marriage is it's not adversarial. Yeah. Courts only have jurisdiction over adversarial relationships. Right. I mean, you can petition the court for stuff, declaration of rights, okay? But when it's two parties, husband and wife, are not parties. Mm -hmm. They're one person. They're one yeah, person. Okay, one, Legally one, one person. wants to leave the union. Okay, we understand that. Yeah. But there's a declaration of that. And yes, yeah. then you're done. <laughs> but, 
but they can't figure out, yeah they can't they do but they're not supposed to create an adversarial situation take money from one party and use it to pay the other party so the adversarial situation can per be perpetuated make one party fight his own money mm -hmm. and if the wife makes money it's still part of the marital estate which is not even described it's not even a party to the case okay so how do you take money out of the marital estate and break apart the marital estate? You don't, you can't do that. But if, if I get something early enough, like when you're deciding to get married or just after you do a post-nuptial agreement and you describe what happens in a situation like that, mm -hmm. where the person who decides to leave the marriage can do so and have the terms already established. And that way it's a matter of contract. It's already a settled matter. And it already is a settled matter anyways. That's a, that's a benefit of having arbitration because if you can get into a post-nuptial where the binding arbitration clause, well then great. Now it's recognized by the court as a settled matter. Whereas if I don't have something like that, I have to argue it's none of your business. And they don't like it because it's a multi-billion dollar franchise of the trial court system. Yeah. Just like traffic court is immensely successful. And I'm not going to argue with, tra with traffic court, although I've sat through, like when I had a traffic ticket, I sit there and watch. I really feel bad for some people. They're getting their butts kicked and maybe they should be getting their butts kicked, but the, maybe we sh we need a system like that, right? It's very efficient. It's a bit unfair, traffic court is, but it gets things done. And there are many irresponsible people. And yeah, maybe some of us have to pay the price for that. But I think that's what, something we need. But we should not have family court that's liquidating people. Mm -hmm. we, we have to do something. It's a The court is a resource, okay, that we pay for it. Be careful when you sign contracts, by the way, because many times contracts ask you to uh, uh, divest your right to go to court. Why would you do that? You've been paying for it. If somebody wants you to enter into a contract and divest your right to use the court in a dispute, say, okay, then return all the money I paid for the court system since I've been alive. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's unconscionable, but you see the point? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Well, this is great. Okay, so perfected, like Elaine's asking, so perf a perfected security interest. Okay, we have a contract, like Ray's saying, we have a contract in writing, it has to be in writing, and it's public record. That's perfected. That's it, yeah. Yeah, replay. Sorry, I, that's why I'm going, I'm just speaking freely because if I'm, if I'm coaching you on the phone, I mean, if I get into something complicated, I, I record it or I send you notes, but since this is being recorded, yeah, play it on, you know, half speed or something. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll sound really funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go check your internal rate, rate of return on a refinance. You guys will be really angry. You'll never want to get a mortgage again. But I have to say, we live in a society and and for several centuries, we, we really do need loan money. It's just that it's being done in a very exploiting way. So, yeah. All right, parents support. Yeah, see, when the parents disagree about mutilating the child, you got a big problem because the court has already a bias. You know? Yeah, it, it leads to abuse and all this. Uh, child abuse. So it's a very sticky situation. I, I had a case recently, and I think one of the people disappeared. I don't know, I don't know what happened to her. I can't, I can't get her on the phone, but... I was working with her and it was that kind of situation where the children were old enough to attack the parents and the one parent was using that against the other parent. And the one parent knew what he was doing. It was the husband and he was using the court to wreck everything, all his, he didn't care. He was, he's destroying his own money. I, was, I don't know what was going on there, but how would he do in that situation? <clears throat> I mean, it's like, really, you're abusing yourself. So I don't know. There's only some things we can do, but really, what what should happen? What what on the large picture? And I don't know. This would be the necessary thing, but if you go back to the public records and you look over the last two years in your county for uh, uh, divorces of any kind, maybe that are still pending, and you look for let's say all men. You don't. It doesn't have to be this way, but let's just say similar cases, right? So we take three men whose wives filed petition, and this whatever happened happened. Okay. And we go back and we look through what happened in the court and we make the argument simply because the family court has the authority to has contempt powers, right? Just by that alone, any agreement stipulations were made under duress just by that alone. 
So we go back and say, look what these people were liquidated in the millions of dollars. And the county caused that ha to happen. It didn't have to happen. And the family was destroyed. And the court violated its mandate to preserve the status quo, you see. So now you have a tort claim. If you go back to these three people, let's just say, and you make a claim against the county, you could liquidate the county. You could place the county in receivership. I'm not saying we should, mm -hmm. but they're on the hook for millions and millions of dollars in almost every case. <laughs> well, John, so it, the court is operating, family courts operating under authority of statutes, right? So the statutes are uh, purely statutory. Yeah. yeah. So statutory or presumption of law. Statutes are a presumption of law. And what's sure. the implementing regs on those statutes implementing uh, regulations of authority? You know, they, like with the IRS, you always had the parallel tables of authority. Well, okay. The, now keep in mind, the IRS is an executive agency, all right? So the court is a judicial office. It's a constitutional office and it's run by statute. So it's the statute itself. And then you have the rules of civil procedure and you do have administrative rules too for um, Administrative Procedures Act. You do have a, a state version of all that, all that as well. But when you're talking about implementing regs, it's the rules of civil procedure and the statutes. But yeah, there's a presumption. But again, my point is that the statute does not create an underlying debt obligation for which the court can then liquidate and or penalize you with criminal penalties for not giving up your rights. <laughs> it's the missing it's a it's the missing foundational element it doesn't exist. No underlying debt. I'll give an example. I had a case uh years ago, it was a long time ago, but this attorney he got overzealous. <laughs> he's suing my client in um it was a just a like a Citibank case, right? So he's get it was Chase Bank. He was getting overzealous and in the middle of the proceeding we're still in discovery. And I'm asking where the, where's the evidence of the underlying debt? Because even creditors are so lazy, they don't even have the contract. I said, how can you allege default when you haven't even alleged the debt contract? You know? So then without even answering me, he files a motion to the court to attach his the guy's uh, vehicle as if he was a lender on the on the vehicle. So I filed an objection. And I here's my argument. I said. An unsecured creditor cannot use the court to change the risk. He took the risk. It was an unsecured debt. You had a choice. You could have made it a secured debt or just not given him the loan. But you can't now come into the court and create less risk with the court's order. And the judge agreed. He's like, sorry, dude. You can't come in here for that. And by the way, we're still in discovery. So shut up. You didn't win yet. <laughs> you know, you got to win the case first, you know. Dang. But yeah, that's, a th I mean, the judge did the right thing. There was a case in New York. I said, I saw um, uh, the, the judge made a ruling uh, and it was a, it was a divorce and they had stipulations and all that stuff. But um, here's what the judge said. He goes, I'm, I'm declaring the dissolution of the marriage. And as to the stipulations reached by the parties, I can't pass on those. That's exactly what he's supposed to be doing. Now, the stipulations should not be a matter of public record, and they shouldn't be within the purview of the court. Why? Right. The judge acknowledged that he's not needing to pass on those because it's not within his jurisdiction. That's what he's supposed to be doing. Some mm -hmm. judges will do the right thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not making this stuff up, guys. <laughs> I know you believe me, but, I'm, you know, it's just another example. There are, there, you will find cases that the, the judge knows what he's supposed to be doing. It's rare and rare because uh, I hate to say a lot of them, the good ones are retired, are retiring. Mm -hmm. That's when you start getting the truth. If you can ever talk to some of these older guys, the women that have been retiring and they were being judges, they'll start telling you what's going on. You know? mm -hmm. Same way with law enforcement. A lot of the top, you know, yeah. they didn't agree, they left. And lawyers too. Lawyers will type down. That's how I learned a lot of things. I talked to the, I talked to a lot of people and, um, they tell me the insider stuff, but it's after they, they're not using it anymore to make money. They won't tell you that while they're trying trying to use the system to make money. <laughs> I mean, you got to think, you think, okay, I'm going to go to law school. I'm, I'm 18, 20. I'm going to law school because lawyers make $300 an hour. Okay. So that's why I want to go to law school, right? That's typically, come on guys, admit it. That's why they go to law school. So they don't realize they're part of a, a really a prestigious association. I mean, maybe that's why they go. Or maybe their father or mother was a lawyer or something. 
And, and then they get into the system and they get indoctrinated and they realize what they got themselves into. And they're like, oh my God, I got so much money and time invested. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. And so that's, that's when that lawyer, that person becomes a lawyer and is a different creature, is a different than he was when he came in, right? When he, when he went to the, uh, when he started there. So that's what we're dealing with. There's too much money and they will fight you to the end if you challenge their franchise, okay? Yeah. Family court is a franchise of the trial court. Mm -hmm. It should not exist. Yeah. So, so how do you, what are your thoughts on, how, how do you police a corrupt judge that puts a property rights situation with a family into receivership and with him as a receiver when there's no underlying evidence okay. of debt? So let's, let's uh, that's a very good question. Let's express this as a tort. A tort is a wrong. And a tort is instituted by a tort feeser, to use the language, right? The wrongdoer. So it's a tort. And what kind of tort is it? Well, if we're talking about property, private property, intangible private property, mm -hmm. then it's trespass on private property. Hmm. it's an action in tort for the trespass upon or against the person or private property and or both. It's a tort of trespass. Now there's another version of that. A tort of trespass can also be expressed on a very narrow set of facts known as invasion of privacy. Imagine this. What about receiving stolen property? Is there a civil cause of action for receiving stolen property? I think there is. <laughs> yeah. What about theft? If the court is acting in receivership or appoints a receiver, isn't the receiver receiving stolen property? Isn't the definition of receiving stolen property taking possession of property where you had no right in the beginning? Now, And a receiver has to be bonded and insured too. It, okay, he doesn't have to be. If he's not, that means he's self-insured. If he is, that just mm -hmm. means the surety is liable, but ultimately the receiver is liable. And would there be something about, because it's a public official, doing it, um, is there a tort there? A receiver That's is an officer of the court, and yes, there's a tort, and you have to do a waiver of immunity. So if you want to proceed against these creatures, first thing I'd recommend is you waive immunity for the judge. So you, you just serve notice on the proper office. Mm -hmm. And that's in your tort claims act for your state. Go look it up. You'll, it'll tell you how to do it. It's instructions. Mm -hmm. So you serve notice, you waive the judge's immunity. It's not magical. It's very simple. And then uh, I, separately from that, I would make an insurance claim with the county for damages caused by a county employee. That's assuming your judge is an employee of the county. Most are, mm -hmm. some are of the state. So you have to figure that out. But you make an insurance claim through the Office of Risk Management for your county board of supervisors. They're insured for this, guys. Uh, and you, sometimes you have to use the form provided. Sometimes it has to be under penalty of perjury. Sometimes it's a letter. But you have to be specific and tell them who did what and what damages you suffered. And you have to demand it. Now, what's going to happen typically in that case is the lawyer is going to look at that and go, well, there's nothing wrong here. And then deny the claim, which is all you really want. Once the claim is denied, then you sue the county for the damages once the claim is denied. If you don't get a claim denied, you can't sue the county for damages. Mm. If you want to sue the judge, sue the judge, but waive his immunity first, and then mm -hmm. sue the tort and the damages. Mm -hmm. It's an action in tort. Now, ironically, the same court that caused the damages, you're going to ask for the remedy. You just have to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Recusing mm -hmm. a judge is not helping anything. I want to keep that judge on there. Mm -hmm. And this is my funny analogy. I'm sorry, pardon the analogy, because I just, I love telling stories. And this is, was when I, my first partner, my, the, one, the guy that showed me some of this stuff, he said he used to work at a convenience store and, and he was very good at reading people. And one night some guy came in and he knew this guy was going to rob him. And, and my, my partner was a tough guy. He does not intimidated by anybody. But he, he knew this guy was going to rob him. So he's just waiting for the guy to come over and say whatever he's going to say to rob him. Like, give me all the money in the till or whatever. So the guy comes over and, and, and pulls out this knife. This is like the size of his finger, like this big. And he sticks it in my friend's face. And Frank grabbed his arm and pulled his whole body across the counter and started beating him over the head with his forearm. <laughs> and the guy couldn't get away fast enough. And he ran away, you know. 
So that's my thinking. If the judge wants to misbehave, you want him on the case forever until he gives. Beat the crap out of him. Get him to make all these errors and, and, and problems. I'll give you an example. So in one case we're working right now, uh, that my client gets, and this is another point I want to make. The client gets a letter from child protective or whatever, child support. Says, hey, you're late in child support. And he's never paid child support. You're late in child support. We don't argue about the fact that he's been pay paying child support forever, right? He's paid for everything, right? Millions of dollars. You're late in child support, this corporation says. So his response is, wait a minute, who are you? You're not a party to this case. <laughs> and by the way, uh, this case is in receivership. So if you want money, it's in the custody of the receiver, which it was. He has no money. They took it. And we told him to go talk to the receiver. And the receiver said, well, I don't, I'm not involved in this. Yet he's the one with all the power over all the person's property. He just took it. He froze all his bank accounts and took all his property. So you don't pay child support when you're in the middle of a divorce proceeding or even after you don't pay child support or alimony. If anybody says you owe it to the state, like child support services or something, you send them a letter and say, no, you got to talk to the receiver. If there's no obvious receiver appointed, you name the judge and say, here's the receiver. You give him the judge's name and address and say, he's got all my property, which he does. If you're in the custody of the court, which is what's happening because you're in receivership, the receiver is who you talk to. Let me give an example. If I'm in bankruptcy court and the trustee, the moment I come in there and the, the trustee accepts my reorganization plan in the chapter 13 filing, for example, he's within the custody of all my property. He owns everything because it's his job to liquidate it because I asked him to, to protect. <clears throat> so if, if someone, a creditor comes along and says, Hey, John, you got to pay this money. I'm going to say, talk to the receiver. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't, I can't go around the receiver. I can't go around the receiver. You got to talk to the receiver. I'm in receivership. That's the whole point of being in receivership. You have to talk to the receiver. And that's what you get. Yeah. If you know anybody who's in the situation or you are in the situation, and you're looking at child support or something like that, or payments, and you're paying into the court or something like that, you need to send a letter and say, hey, this is a receivership. You need to talk to the receiver. I don't have any money. The receiver has all my money. And I don't care if you have $1,000 in the bank and you can spend it. That's not your money. That's the receiver's. He's just letting you spend it. You have to understand how this is working. The receivership never ends. Mm. As long as you're paying alimony and child support or they want you to, you're in receivership. You shouldn't be paying, ironically. So the court order to pay is an order for the receiver to pay it. So we did this. We made this argument. And then the judge tried to fix it. And that's when my client called me and said, John, it looks like they're trying to fix that. what they screwed up. They made the mistake. I said, exactly. Now you're starting to understand. They screwed up. Because they're so used to getting away. They're, they're sloppy now. They're so mm -hmm. used to getting away with this stuff. And we called them on it. We said, wait a minute. This is in receivership. You said yourself, Judge, that you appointed a receiver. Why are you asking for money from me? Talk to the receiver. And so the court's trying to now order this and order that. That's how the court, judge tries to fix everything. I'm going to make more orders. Mm -hmm. Tear them apart a new one with this response. You know, we're going we're gonna to rip it apart. But it's making them it's making them screw everything up because they're so used to getting away with it. Right. Yeah. So the remedy is you waive the judge's immunity, you waive the receiver's immunity because he does have some immunity, or he's insured, or he's self-insured. So I would just see, I would, I would, he's an officer of the court. I would still, I would still waive the immunity for the receiver, definitely for the judge. And then if there's a guardian ad litem, possibly him too. That's an officer of the court. Mm -hmm. And um once you waive the immunity, you go ahead and make your claim. Get ready to make your claim, though. Make your insurance claim with the county. You got You only have so many days to make your insurance claim from the date of the incident. So every time they like froze your bank account or made you pay money or whatever, threatened you or whatever, that begins the clock. So you have to make your insurance claim, make another insurance claim, and maybe can make one every three months. And then as soon as it's denied, sue. It's denied if they ignore it and exceeds the statute of limitations. So mm -hmm. I shouldn't say statute of limitations. There's a time period governed by statute that says the claim has to be you know addressed within 120 days 30 days whatever if, if the statute says 30 days you wait 30 days if there's no response or it's denied overtly you then have the your ticket to sue mm -hmm. sue the county 
or the state. Mostly it's going to be the county. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is all, it's all voluntary in a divorce proceeding. And if you remove the uh, element of contempt, you'll see that you should be able to just tell the judge, nah, I've already been paying all the bills all these years. I'm going to keep on doing the same thing. I'm not going to change. The judge can't say anything about it. <laughs> he shouldn't even be talking about it. Just like he, he can't just show up at your house on Saturday afternoon, open your front door, walk in, pop a beer and sit in the couch and start changing your TV channel. That's what he's doing. You think that's okay. <laughs> about I don't know about you, but I would let that, you know. So anyways, it's it's just another way to look at property rights and see what's going on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean the property, the guy who has the liability, the per, the person who has the liability. It's like I told one of the, the one of the moms uh, during the funny pandemic. Uh she was getting kind of beat up by the other parents and some they were going to a soccer game and so whatever it was. And uh it was it was a custody thing going on actually, and and I said, well, you you have all the care, you're taking care of your son, so you have all the liability. Who are these people? You're the one paying all the bills. You're the one that's responsible legally. So who are these people to tell you anything? You tell them that the one who's liable is the one with all the authority. So shut up. The one with the liability makes the rules. You've heard the saying, "He who has the gold makes the rules." He who has the liability does make the rules. Mm -hmm. But and also that all. statement, if you have liability, that gives you the authority. So many, that's the whole thing that yeah. went on during COVID. Nobody would accept, no no employers had liability for- There, uh, there was no duty. So right. they had no authority, yeah. Yeah, and the court can never have a duty, by the way. <laughs> by the way, but if you're thinking, okay, John, maybe my state legislature is going to write some new laws. Try, try it. You can never- have liability over taking care of your spouse or children unless there's an adoption or some official like you can go on public funds and go to the court and get an official adoption okay we need the courts for that also by the way to establish parental duties but these are a matter of statute that you, you have to ask the court for help and we want that because it's a public interest but not even if you've adopted children the, the court doesn't have the authority unless there's abuse or neglect you get the same rights whether or not they're your natural children, okay? So, hope that helps maybe, yeah. I hope you're not in that situation and you don't care. But if you are, or you've heard those stories before, consider the idea that you might be subject to programming. I was, I I wouldn't even take a, a divorce case or anything like that for, for years because I felt like it was outside of my understanding until I realized, I looked at a few of them closely and I was like, wait a minute, how is the court doing this with no underlying debt? And I, and I didn't really, I didn't get it until the one case where the judge says, I'm going to appoint a receiver. And then it hit me. I was like, oh, crap. They're liquidating everybody. Mm -hmm. It is a receivership because mm -hmm. everything look, I'm like, wait a minute. How, how is the judge ordering this? Where, where's the obligation? They wouldn't do that in a debt collection. They wouldn't do that in a corporate bankruptcy. But how are they going to do this in a... Family court, you know, mm -hmm. it's a receivership. So mm -hmm. if you go look at your statutes for family court, you'll see that it's literally a bankruptcy proceeding. Go read your statutes. Look what they're doing to your property. They think they can. They can't, they can only do it in part when there's evidence of abuse or neglect to, to shore everything up, preserve mm -hmm. the status quo. That is the underlying rule. Yeah, it is. So uh, we're, it's recording. Well, Karen, it'll be there. I'm going to publish it just like for last week. I haven't published that one yet, but I'll put it up on the um, Telegram discussion thing. But anyways, I hope this helps you guys a little bit. Did you want to add anything uh, similar or, you know, contracts or anything or anything weird going on? All right. Well, that's kind of promising. I don't know. No, that was very <laughs> educational. Yeah, that's okay. oh, Trump was indicted. Oh, again? <laughs> all 14, what was it? How many? All counts? 37. Well, somebody was mentioning to me, Ray, because we're, we're all involved with this uh, easement stuff and the taking of the property. Somebody was mentioning to me today about, in North Carolina, they're allowing squatters also. And the the police are allowing it, like in Georgia. So it's... Wow. 
it's, a, it's, no, it's changed now. It's changed in Georgia. So, so they had a bill went through the House and Senate here. The governor signed it. Okay. It's all changed. Three days, it turns to a felony. They're coming and dragging them out by their collar. Oh, they are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's a felony. Then the police have to act and they can't be countermanded by some sergeant that doesn't want to do it. So now because it's Correct. a felony. Okay, that's cool. So you, got, valid, yeah. you still got some some help there. You still got a little bit of government intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, <laughs> they had to make that. Realize up. that. Switch from being see before. Remember, it was a civil, it was a landlord tenant. They okay. it was being contrived with fake uh, lease agreements. They now it's like no. They, they asked the property owner. Making that it a felony a that tells me they're really trying to solve the problem. That's the way. Yeah. yeah. Three days. They they're, they're not out in three days. They come in with SWAT team, whatever it takes. They drag them out. Okay, good. That should fix a lot of it for Georgia. And because Georgia was one of the main states because of the way the laws were set up with the landlord tenant. So yeah. Mm. yeah, we will notice a trend of using more and more tech to get access to to products and services. So yeah, I know about the the, the Costco and all this. Uh, Disney World has been testing this technology. The biometric collection data, you know, for for years, uh, Disney World, the, the parks in Florida have been used using the collection of biometric data for many years. They're not using it; uh, they're not collecting biometric data as the as the FBI would. They're just doing it to make their system work. But it's a test, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It's a test to see how people will act. I mean, okay, guys, think about it like this. And I, you know, I go to Disney World every year, or I used to. <laughs> I, I fed up with those idiots, so I'm gonna go back there. But. Uh, mm -hmm. Disney is great about managing people and they're, they, it's first class. I have to say they take care of stuff. They take care of people. They do the right thing because partially they should, because it's a financial liability. If they don't, they're handling a lot of people. And it dawned on me after considering that, cause I'm standing in line waiting, you know, and I'm seeing what they're doing. And I'm like, man, they're really good at getting people to do stuff. <laughs> you know, um, government is about managing people. It could be a dictatorship family <laughs> dynasty, like in China. Or it can be a three-branch government with administrative law here in the states. It's still about managing people. I don't really think it's all about this constitutional stuff, like Fifth Amendment and all that stuff. None of that matters. It's about managing people. Same mm -hmm. with the tax code. Yeah. You can collect taxes against people. You don't need all this statute and stuff. I think they just do that to create a whole sphere of you know influence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, way. it's all really a banking system, anyways. All right. Well, great show. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I hope you appreciate that. I mean, I, I find it compelling. It's really interesting. Yes. Yes. It's shocking to see what's going on, but I think there's a remedy. It's a hard road, but we, we have a remedy and we can fix stuff. And I think we can do it in a short time. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm to... really eager to like get into it. Yeah. 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 I think if we do a few cases correctly, we'll be all right. It's yeah. going to start the trend. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways. All right, guys. Well, and I know it's, you know, whatever, hitting the weekend already. So great guys, call. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great call. Thank you. Weekend. Look forward to next week, y'all. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.